I came to this book because I was really concerned about being handed false choices uh, and being asked to choose between jobs and the environment uh, really stuck in my craw. The notion that somehow preserving the earth, which is the basis of all of our prosperity and all of our ability to sustain life, should somehow be at odds with our ability to make a living on a daily basis. And that as the climate crisis really kind of brought to a head that these two issues about our long-term sustainability, uh, protecting the health of our children, was at odds with our immediate prosperity and putting food on the table for our children every day. And that simply is a false choice and it can't be acceptable. We have to figure another way out. That was Allen Press author Bracken Hendricks, and this is Jennifer Pullinger, e-content editor at Allen Press, and your guide to this edition of the Allen Press podcast, which is part of Allen Interactive, located at www.islandpress.org. Allen Interactive is where you can talk back to our authors and get more information about our books, programs, and solutions for the environment. Go to our website now and download a copy of our Global Warming Reader, a collection of chapters from some of our best books that highlight effective solutions to global warming, including those from Ignition, Apollo Spire, Lives Per Gallon, and more. Jay Inslee and Bracken Hendricks, co-authors of the new book, Apollo Spire, Igniting America's Clean Energy Economy, want to start an energy revolution, one that will lead the way to a reduction in greenhouse gas emissions and greater economic growth. Inslee is a U.S. congressman from Washington State, and Hendricks is the founder of the Apollo Alliance and senior fellow with the Center for American Progress. In this episode, we take an excerpt from Inslee and Hendricks' book signing at Olson's Books and Records in Washington, D.C., where they talk to audience members about how people can make a clean energy future a reality. When Bracken and I started to write this book about a year and a half ago, we were optimistic about this concept that we could grow millions of good-paying jobs in this country. And I'll just tell you, after a year and a half of meeting the hundreds of people that we met across the country who are now tonight engaged in developing a new clean energy for this country, we are twice as optimistic as we started. And the reason is, and we'll talk about tonight, some of the folks we met in this effort, we found that we, you cannot turn over a rock in America without finding a genius who is developing some new technology, business model, community activity, or uh, effort even in agriculture areas to grow a new clean energy technology. But we think there's something missing that we hope that this book will fulfill in sparking this clean energy economy. And that what has been missing is a sense of optimism and a vision on how to actually do this. So what we did is we spent a year and a half on the road and on the internet and on the phones talking to people about how to build that vision and what that vision would look like. And uh, since this is a reading, we thought I'd, I'd read a couple sentences here uh, to provoke an idea about, about what we found. And I'll start with one of the, um, the, the coolest guys we met uh, during this. This is chapter two. Uh, this is called Reinventing the Car. I'll read just a couple paragraphs. To see the future of the American automobile, take a spin down at Corte Madera, California, and introduce your, uh, yourself to the Cal Car Boys. This group of rebels met one sunny day in April 2004 in the garage of a typical condominium 10 miles north of the Golden Gate, determined to roll out a car that could be fueled by plugging it into a wall at night with a standard extension cord and run on gas when needed. It was a Toyota Prius when they started and a symbol of an American revolution in automobiles when they finished. The group was led by Felix Kramer, an entrepreneur who had an idea as big as his mustache. In 2003, we have a picture of the mustache in here, by the way. In 2003, after selling his internet startup, he cast about for his next adventure and landed on an audacious quest to revolutionize the auto industry. He knew that gas-powered internal combustion cars were destroying the atmosphere and deepening our addiction to oil, and that things had to change. Felix decided to build a mass market for this change. Quote, Our whole auto configuration was decided by just a very few people, a handful of big auto company execs and the government. They had fouled up. 
It was time to expand the number of Americans who had a hand in this future. So I decided to build a large group of folks who would demand the production of a clean, efficient car. To do that, I knew we had to first build such a car. So that's exactly what we did. A multi-talented group of innovators answered Felix's internet call. They met in Ron's garage. The team then put the internet to work to generate open source ideas they could incorporate into the design. Two years and a thousand feet of wire later, they had converted a 2004 Prius into a car capable of driving on nothing but electricity from the garage wall jack for the first 25 miles each day. Felix's plug-in may be the first car ever built over the internet. Now, this guy has now provoked a revolution in the automobile industry, which is now much more in garages. And we move on and then tell the story about how General Motors has now seen the light and is now on a path to build the General Motors Volt that they hope to have on the road by 2010 or 2011, if the right policies get enacted. And when they do that, we will be building with union jobs in the United States of America the cleanest mass-produced car in the world built right here in the United States. Hopefully that we can start shipping to China at some point. And when we do that, you'll plug your car in at night, you drive 20 to 40 miles on nothing but electricity, pure zero carbon dioxide emitting, and then you can burn gasoline or at some point cellulosic ethanol, a clean biofuel, which is four to five times cleaner than corn ethanol, and we're going to have a dream machine because of the genius of Americans that we've learned about in writing this book. Next, Hendricks talked about how we shouldn't have to choose between jobs and the environment and why he and Inslee have optimism for a clean energy movement. Jay clearly shared this vision we'd been been working on uh, in the policy arena, and we realized as we were talking that we both basically wanted to write pretty much the same book, and we started sharing outlines, and we realized that, uh, that we really wanted to tell stories, and we wanted to tell stories about hope. Um, we are at a a distressing moment. Um, you know, this summer, an area six times the size of California melted in the Arctic, uh, the largest melting of, uh, of polar, the polar ice cap uh, documented. Um, it, it's an alarming situation. Global warming can bring, you know, malaria to higher elevations where all the cities are in Africa. Um, it'll, it'll disrupt soil moisture and interrupt agricultural productivity. Um, it's going to cause huge problems in our water supplies, in our, in our forests, in our, the very basis of our economy. Um, and yet Jay and I are optimistic, and we're in fact more optimistic at the end of writing this book than we were when we went in to write it. So we, we, we started telling these stories and researching these technologies. Jay was talking about the plug-in hybrid car. That's a wonderful story. It moves from, an in, from a group of inventors and technologists actually moving the largest car company on the planet to introduce this prototype, the, the Volt. Uh, it stands to be a mass market car. It can get uh, over 100 miles for every gallon of gasoline. Um, if you start using the cellulosic ethanol, it can get up to 500 miles for every gallon of fuel. Today we're spending $200,000 a minute on imported oil. $200,000 a minute. So what we propose is we could take the money that's flowing out of our communities, flowing out of our economy, and reinvest it. And the really exciting thing about energy efficiency, about renewable technology, is these are investments that are made in communities. They're embedded in the skills of workers. They're embedded in new technology. You're taking the very same dollar that you would spend on energy that leaked out of your windows and that, that went up smokestacks to produce pollution, and you're spending it on you know, a heating and air conditioning service mechanic to come and, and, and test and balance your air conditioning unit. You're spending it on more skilled labor in building maintenance. So you're investing in people. You're actually creating career ladders. You can read more about the innovators who are leading the clean energy movement in Apollo's Fire, Igniting America's Clean Energy Economy. For more information about co-authors Jay Inslee and Bracken Hendricks, visit www.islandpress.org.